Mike Burstyn has had starring roles in international co-productions such as The Dybbuk, uh, Sabine, and The Spy Who Never Was, plus many featured roles on Israeli and American uh, film and television, of course, when he's not on stage. Azimuth is his feature writing, directing, and producing debut. Um, it is partially inspired by his experience entertaining Israeli soldiers in the Sinai during the Six-Day War. Both throw down our weapons in the sand and drive away from here. And go where? You will come with me. Or be your prisoner. How lucky for me. The war is over, you idiot. We'd say anything to take that jeep. Two soldiers, one jeep. One goal. Survival. You up there? You talk to me? No, to Moshe Dayan. What do you want? How is this going to end? Did I kill you? Will you kill me? I'm willing to discuss a way out of here. All right, let's hear it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Azimuth. So to begin, Mike, uh, I I'd like to discuss with you a little bit about the genesis of this film, and, and with that, you know, what were some of the biggest, you know, challenges and some of the most pleasant surprises you encountered while developing and shooting this film? The biggest challenge was money, <laughs> as it always is uh, in any film endeavor, but especially in the Israeli uh, film industry. Uh, that's probably the most difficult thing is to raise the kind of budget that you need uh, to make a film like this look like a film like this. Um, the budget on this film, I've always been asked, is, uh, is not to be believed, but uh, we have that ability. The Israeli film industry has uh, developed in such a magnificent way. Our films today are far beyond what anybody dreamt of uh, in 1965, 66, or 64, when we did Salah Shabbati, uh, we couldn't have imagined uh, the progress that it has made. Israeli films today are recognized internationally as some of the finest films you can see today internationally. So this film uh, actually is a story that I received from a friend of mine after the Six-Day War. It was a two-page story that he gave me and he said um, someday this should be a film and I've kept this story with me all these years uh, and about two years ago I realized we are approaching the 50th commemoration of the Six Day War last year and I said maybe this is the right time to take it out of my drawer and look at it again and I said yes it it is the right message uh, although, you know, we don't make films to, to uh, um, relay messages, uh, I think it was uh, one of the famous uh, Jewish-American uh, producers in Hollywood many years ago that says, if you want to send a message, send a telegram. You know? If you're making a movie, it's got to entertain as well. 
This was a story that I wanted to develop, and I at first was looking for a screenwriter that would take it and develop it into a full-fledged uh, screenplay. Um, the truth was that uh, it was too expensive to find a screenwriter today because uh, the minimum for a Writers Guild is way beyond what I could have afforded. So I said, you know what, today you, you can buy the software and uh, I decided to try it myself. I worked on it for quite a while and I came up with the screenplay and I uh, decided I'd like to direct it myself. Uh, and the result is up on the screen. You may ask me what the budget was. I can tell you that this film was shot for 2.4 million shekel, which is about $600,000, which is amazing. But it just shows you what you can accomplish with the talent that we have in Israel, really. Well, I, to follow that, I, I guess I'd like to ask, having worked with quite a few great directors over the years, you know, are you, are you kind of cognizant, can you pinpoint any, any insights or inspiration that, that you took from them, you know, knowingly for your first feature film as director? The greatest compliment I got uh, as a result of directing this film was from Sami Sheikh, the uh, Egyptian-American actor. I wanted to make sure that I cast this authentically. And uh, the greatest lesson I learned as a director, but I, I knew this all along, uh, the first thing you need is casting. That's the secret to any successful film. It's all about casting. You cast the right people and then stay out of the way. <laughs> Let them do what they do best. But Sammy had worked with some great directors and his last film was with Clint Eastwood, uh, American Sniper. And after our film, he said, and he, he gave an interview, and he said, um, I think I can compare Mike uh, to some of the greatest directors I worked with, including Clint Eastwood, which was the greatest compliment. I was a little hesitant at first, uh, because it is quite an undertaking. Uh, it's hard to imagine what directing a feature film means. It's m more than, than I uh, imagined, but having come from the acting side of it, uh, I knew how I would want to be treated by a director as an actor. And I think that's what made it so easy um, directing these actors that entrusted me with their careers, basically, because ultimately they're up there on the screen, not me. If I had been in their shoes, I know how I would have wanted a director to work with me. And that's, I think, probably my, that was uh, the greatest asset I had as a, as a director. Uh, other than that, it, it, you're, you're really in charge of, um, you know, it's like a general in charge of all these different aspects from, uh, you know, from the bottom up. It's all on your shoulders. And you have to make the, ult the ultimate decision is, is yours. And, um, but the moment I stepped on the set the first day, all my doubts disappeared. It was as if I've been doing it... Uh, uh, forever, and I guess it's a result of having worked with some wonderful people through the years, with other directors, cinematographers. This was shot on di digital, which is uh, makes it so much easier today to shoot a film like this. Uh, otherwise, it would have cost a fortune. I'd like to ask one more question before I turn this over to the audience. And um, I, I alluded in, in my introduction that I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about Salah. I was hoping you could tell us you know, a little bit about your experience working on that film and being directed by Ephraim Kishon, you know, really anything that you've held dear or anything that comes to mind about that. This was Kishon's first directorial debut as well. Kishon was a, a great humorist, a, a great satirist, and he undertook to direct this film. And they entrusted him in this because at the time we didn't have the technicians, the technical crew, and so they imported, the producer was Menachem Golan, and Menachem, may he rest in peace, was a great producer, 
So he decided if Kishon insisted on directing it himself, he better cover his, you know, himself uh, technically, because Kishon obviously was not a film director. And so he imported um, Floyd Crosby. Floyd Crosby was a, an American cinematographer who won an Oscar for High Noon. And somehow he managed to get Floyd Crosby to come to Israel. And so everybody was really, you know, uh, assured that no matter what Kishon does, the film will look like a movie. Kishon was a very soft-spoken, he had a very wry, but a wonderful sense of humor. But it all begins with a story, with the, you know, with the script. Everything, you know, the basis for anything like this was the story that we're telling. If, you, if the story works, if you're telling a good story, the film will succeed. And the story of Salah was, was magnificent, and the, uh, the portrayal that uh, Chaim Topol gave uh, as Salah. We actually established, you know, we created the film industry in 1964. Uh, we were making it up as we went along, but when you see it today, even Salah, you know, it, it's marvelous because it is authentic. It's real. That's how it was, you know. And although it was, a, you know, we were in our chitulim, uh, as we say, in, in our diapers, but the results, you know, uh, still today, when you look at it, um, it, it, uh, it stands up. It stands for itself. As an entertainer, as someone who is known for musical and comedy, what drew you to this particular subject that is neither musical nor comedy? You know, they, they always say that, that comedians or clowns uh, um, are really, in private life, very serious people. You know? um, this story, to me, um, is really uh, a metaphor for what's been going on between us and our neighbors forever. And having been in the Six Day War and seen the result of the horror of what goes on, uh, when I read the story, to me it said, this is the only solution. These are two men who uh, basically are similar they both have families, they both have lives. Their important uh, daily problems are, uh, one of them just had a son and had a bris, and the other one has a son and uh, has been plucked out. Each one of them has, have been plucked away from their daily lives, not of their own free will. There's no reason why they want to be there. They have no choice, but ultimately, the only way we're going to survive is through cooperation. And that Jeep cannot drive off without both of them cooperating. So it's really that, that's the analogy. And uh, the story, uh, I knew at some day, um, I want to do more than just um, entertain. I, I want to make uh, a statement. And I held this for 50 years because that's the statement I want. If I said to myself, if I ever direct a film, this is the message I want to convey. And uh, I think people are responding to it. Uh, most of the questions I have are people who have seen it. And I, it's not political, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make a political statement. But the fact is, uh, in the end, that's how we're going to survive. These two men would not have survived um, if they hadn't decided, okay, we need to, uh, we need to survive together. Uh, each one of them could have left the other behind. But uh, despite the fact that the Israeli tried to kill the, the Egyptian, the Egyptian made a choice. And to me, that's an important message as well. If our neighbors will make that choice of nonviolence, it's a matter of making a choice. They have to make that choice. Uh, we obviously, you know, uh, when I say we, I mean Israelis are not interested in war. Now our neighbors need to make that same choice. The only way to move forward is to choose nonviolence. And that's what the Egyptian did in the film. 
It was a heroic decision. He had him there. He could have pulled the trigger. A Kalashnikov fires no matter what, you know. People say, well, maybe it, it you know, uh, it misfired. The, the, the Russian Kalashnikov never misfires. So he had the choice. He made a choice. And uh, that's what it's all about, making a choice. And hopefully maybe that message will resonate with, uh, I'm, try I'm hoping this will be seen not just by Israelis, uh, but by our neighbors as well. Who knows? But it, I, I tried, you know, it's all you can do is try. Quick follow up on that, and then yes, I will turn it back to the audience. As a multilinguist, you know, a speaker of many languages, how important was linguistic realism for you in this film, in the planning of the film? I mean, English is established as a common language for our two protagonists, but you know, were there commercial considerations for this choice as well? I wanted it to be authentic. And when I was casting the, I, I knew I wanted uh, um, uh, Yiftah Klein for the uh, Israeli, but I wanted an authentic actor to portray the Egyptian. I could have chosen Israeli Arab actors. We have some wonderful Arab actors in Israel. Uh, I had a, uh, a suggestion for a Jordanian American actor, but ultimately through a friend I found Sammy. And the first thing I did was meet with him and uh, give him the script. And he said, before I decide, I need to send this to my father in Alexandria. His father, turns out, had fought in the Six Day War on the Egyptian side, obviously. Yiftach's father was on the Israeli side in the, during the Six Day War. But Sammy said, I had to have my father read this and get his approval. And he, he came back to me and he said, my father read it. He said, it's authentic. It's real. Uh, it's not showing uh, the Egyptians as uh, and normally they were shown, you know, after the Six Day War, we really showed the other side in a very negative way. He said, that's how it happened. Uh, it's honorable, and uh, I think you can do it. And that's when Sammy said, I will do it. Uh, I wanted the Egyptian to speak in his own language. I didn't want a, a, a film about Israelis and, and Egyptians speaking in English, which is, to me, is phony. Uh, so we had him speaking in his original language, the Israeli speaking Hebrew, and Obviously, when they have to communicate, the only language they both knew a little bit of was English. So it, it was, uh, you know, it, it made sense. It wasn't phony. The question is, has the film been shown in Egypt or Arab nations? Not yet. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that it will be. Sammy, by the way, is very popular in Egypt as well. He lives in, in, in Los Angeles, but he works in Egypt as well. He took a risk by doing this, a big risk, but he said, I don't care because I believe in this message. I want it to be told. And so, so far, no, uh, but you never know. Right now, uh, we're having these fascinating uh, uh, meetings lately with, is it, what is it, Qatar? Or where was Bibi Reese? Oman. Yeah, Oman. Listen, who knows? <laughs> you never know. Stranger things have happened, but I would very much like it to be seen. That's my, that's my hope. And not just by uh, other countries, but our, you know, our uh, neighbors back home. Let them see it as well. It's their choice to make as well for, th for themselves, for their children, for their families. You know, that's the only way. Just for a brief follow-up here, how was the film received in Calcutta, since we talk about international audiences? The best review I got was from the Calcutta Film Festival. I have no idea, uh, but I'm, I'm really uh, uh, thankful. Uh, the review was so uh, precise and understanding, um, and I guess maybe um, they have some uh, inkling of what it's like uh, because of their relationship with India and Pakistan. And so there's a similarity there between these two countries, these two nations as well. But we won first prize at the Calcutta International 
uh, cult film festival. <laughs> so that question was uh, how the film was received in Israel. The film was, I must say, honestly, commercially, not as successful as we had hoped it would be. And that's simply as a result of, uh, just as it is here in the United States and, and internationally, uh, commercial cinema uh, is very difficult to bring people out to go to the movies unless it's the uh, 18 to, to 30 age range. But this is a film that is geared to uh, people who are uh, interested in history, in what went on, uh, and um, it's tough to get them out because people sit at home and the uh, streaming is the same in Israel as it is here. Everybody has a 80 inch screen and uh, ticket prices are not cheap and so um, it was successful uh, um, artistically uh, it was covered very well as far as the press was concerned and it is now uh, ironically streaming <laughs> in Israel on uh, pay-per-view on YES, on the YES channel, a video on demand. That is what is happening today in the film industry, unless it's Mission Impossible or Wonder Woman, uh, it is very tough to uh, recoup commercially a, fil a, a, a film, uh, not only in Israel, but anywhere else. It's very hard to get distribution as well. Uh, you know, uh, and I must say, uh, we tried with some of these um, companies like Netflix or Amazon, and unfortunately, they passed because the subject of Israel and war, um, it's still, you know, that stigma is still there. They, uh, unfortunately, they didn't want to touch it, so. But uh, I am, I'm really, uh, uh, very uh, uh, pleased with the result of the film. I'm, I'm proud of it, and um, I'm glad you invited us uh, to screen it here. I think it's very important, not just commercially, but it, it's something that will continue on. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. So it was a question about the Lifetime Achievement Award that Mike is about to receive, and whether Azimuth will be featured in that award. I'm flying to Israel to receive it because it's meaningful because it's coming from my peers, the actors and entertainers uh, union in Israel. And uh, I don't know whether they're trying to send me a message, lifetime achievement. <laughs> is it, is the lifetime, is this it, the lifetime? I hope not. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor because it's coming from my friends. Uh, and I have been uh, working in the entertainment industry in Israel uh, for over 50 years. Um, and um, there are not too many of us left <laughs> from, that, from that time. Uh, many of my friends, unfortunately, uh, have passed away. Uh, but it, it's, it's very... Uh, gratifying and they will uh, they tell me include a uh, they prepare videos you know like they do of your lifetime achievement and of course part of it will be um, azimuth because that's my uh, my uh, my goal is to continue uh, uh, I, I really feel that the, you know every um, era uh, of my life has been uh, different, you know. I don't want to keep treading water and doing the same thing over and over. And this was a challenge, uh, and I hope uh, to be able to keep doing this. It's, it's easier, by the way, sitting with, a, a, you know, earphones and watching a monitor than uh, jumping around on stage and uh, singing and dancing. Uh, so this is something that I enjoy. I have several projects that I've been holding on to all these years. And uh, the, actually, the Calcutta reviewer said, 
at the age of 71, he is an, uh, you know, a first-time director. Uh, and I said, so what? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, today 71 is, <laughs> what's 71, right? Yeah, that's Utsik. You know, what are your thoughts about Yiddish theater in 2018? I mean, the current state of affairs. It's not just Yiddish theater, but the Yiddish language, which is uh, important, more than important, to make sure that it continues as a living language. My father used to say that, they say that the Yiddish is dying, uh, but all, he said all those people that said it was dying are already dead and Yiddish is still here. <laughs> you know. Uh, for a hundred years, they said Yiddish, Yiddish starved, but it's not nicht gestorben. They they nicht gestorben, and Yiddish is not do. You know, Yiddish is my mamelushen. It's my mother tongue. You know why Yiddish is called mamelushen, mother's tongue, and not tatelushen. It's called mamelushen. Maybe some of you will understand. As that, <laughs> as the mama hebt uns reden, verliert der Tate das Luschen which means when the mother starts to talk, the father loses his tongue. It's a <laughs> uh, the mother is the main thing. Uh, I grew up in the Yiddish theater with my parents. So throughout the years, whenever I can, I perform in Yiddish because I want to make sure that it, uh, it stays uh, in people's, uh, um, e I would say in their ears more than in their, in their hearts as well. But, uh, you know, Yiddish was the language uh, for over a thousand years. It was the, the language of the majority of children who perished in the Holocaust. Uh, those children, those million and a half children, they didn't speak, uh, you know, uh, Polish. They spoke Yiddish, most of them. If they had survived, Yiddish today would have still been a, f a, f a flourishing language. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the Nazis not only killed, you know, physically uh, obliterated so many people, but also they wanted to kill our culture and our language. Uh, but we can't let that succeed. So for me, uh, as long as I can, I perform in Yiddish. There's still hope, you know, we, uh, we will make sure that Yiddish survives. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.